Welcome to the Guns and Yoga podcast. My name is Wendy Hummel. Today I share a conversation I had with Matt Mentier, a veteran deputy working in Oregon and the founder of the nonprofit organization Blue Line Golf. Matt and I discuss his path to law enforcement and how growing up as the child of a cop influenced him. Matt opens up about events in his childhood, his personal life, and on the job that led him to seek help. We cover some difficult topics such as his father's suicide and other traumatic events, so I wanted to prepare anyone who may not be in a place to hear this conversation. Matt shares how he stumbled upon something that provided him the opportunity to relax and be mindful, playing golf. I encounter a lot of first responders who are really turned off by the word mindfulness, and I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe the word has oversaturated the market. We hear it a lot, or they think it's too woo-woo, or maybe they just don't think it works. In the work that I do, the people that I encounter day in and day out talk so much about being present, and they're actually describing what mindfulness is, but they use very different language. So I wanted to take a moment to define it because I have a lot of friends who play golf, hunt, fish, or do martial arts or woodworking. Often we associate meditation with mindfulness, and while this is absolutely one gateway to mindfulness, it's not the only way. As my friend and colleague Kim Colgrove likes to say, meditation is to mindfulness as exercise is to fitness. Yes, if you want to be more mindful, meditation can absolutely help with that. In fact, it's my favorite way to practice mindfulness. But mindfulness is a way of being all of the time. It's non-judgmental present moment awareness. I talk to so many that find peace and solace in nature or other outdoor activities. It provides an opportunity to be present with nature with little to no distractions. And one person told me that they can hear themselves think and just be when they're outside. My mindfulness practice is yoga, meditation, and walking outside. What's yours? If it helps keep you grounded and helps to keep you present in all areas of your life, then you can understand. Mindfulness helps at work. Being self-aware is a component of emotional intelligence, and it can help keep you in check during high-stress situations. Self-awareness is a crucial part of officer safety. Mindfulness helps in our relationships and really anything that we do. You can even mindfully wash the dishes. Think about how often we aren't present and how much we miss out on. Our brains really aren't designed to necessarily be mindful, so it can be a challenge and something that we need to be very intentional about. We're hardwired to look for threats and danger, and first responders know this more than anyone. While this is absolutely necessary in certain situations while we're at work, it doesn't always serve us in other areas of our life, and that's where mindfulness practices can come in. Okay, back to Matt. He tells of a time when he was in a trauma-informed training class designed to work with victims of domestic violence when he first learned about the term vicarious trauma. He explains his aha moment because he recognized vicarious trauma in himself. His story prompted a memory for me from 2016. This was the first time I heard my now dear friend and colleague, Darren Ivey, teach about secondary trauma. I remember having a knot in my stomach and having to hold it together emotionally when I first heard him discuss the impact of hearing about other people's traumas. As a person's crimes detective, I would occasionally get overwhelmed with emotion and even sometimes feel physical symptoms when I was interviewing somebody or working a case. I stuffed it down and held it together in the moment, but I didn't always find a way to deal with it. And hearing this was common, but not a healthy response to not so normal work somehow made me feel less ashamed. I now know a whole lot more about secondary trauma and vicarious trauma and really have made it my mission to educate other first responders as well. Matt has found solace and purpose in golf, and he now shares his love for the game with other law enforcement officers. Blue Line Golf's mission is to improve the mental and physical health of active and retired law enforcement officers through golf. In Matt's words, golf became a way to relieve stress, 
connect with myself, my family, and friends, and the mindfulness practice of golf has been instrumental in helping me improve my life. Enjoy the show. Today, I'm going to be talking with Matt Mintier. He has been a law enforcement officer since 2004, and he is the founder and director of Blue Line Golf. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, Wendy. Thank you. So, Matt, um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You know, um, my business name is Blue Line Yoga, and you're Blue Line Golf. So we've got that, like, right off the bat, we got that going for us. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I really like it when obviously we get to get together with people that are from across the country with similar, um, a similar passion for wellness and sharing stories and, and trying to help other first responders. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and I'm so glad you reached out. Oh yeah. This has been great to connect with you. And, uh, I'm, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm pretty nervous. We've talked about this, this is my first, uh, podcast and my first time telling the story, uh, of my journey uh, publicly. So it's a, it's a little nerve wracking. So bear with me a little bit. Yeah, no. And that's completely understandable. And thank you very much for having the courage and willingness and vulnerability, quite honestly, to be willing to do that because that's what we need more of. So much appreciated. Well, why don't we just start out by you introducing yourself to us? Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your career. And I always like to, I'm always curious to know how people decided to become cops. Like what, was it something you always wanted to do? Or is it something that just kind of you stumbled into? So if you could, if you could tell us, that'd be great. Uh, I think I was kind of doomed to be in this uh, profession from, uh, from birth. Uh -oh. uh, my, <laughs> my dad was a, a cop and my mom was an ER nurse. Oh and yeah. And so I grew up in a very different household, uh, mm. where we lived a, a little bit different life. Um, uh, so our conversations weren't, uh, normal. Our, my parents didn't have a nine to five and it was just, it was different. And so from an early age, I, uh, got a chance to like do ride alongs with my dad. I'm like, man, this is fun. And what little boy doesn't want to drive fast cars and, and chew guns and help people. It's like, there's very exciting and growing up in the eighties and looking up to like watching movies about Rambo and the heroes like that, it kind of sticks with you. Yeah. So you watched Rambo and I watched Charlie's Angels and Wonder Woman and the Bionic Woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I found myself uh, in high school thinking like, that's the direction I want to go. Uh, I don't know if it was going to be uh, local or feds at the time. And I'm like, okay, that's the, the path I'm going to put myself on. So, you know, that's really interesting because you grew up you were a child of a police officer. I mean, and so that that's interesting because that had to have been very unique. I mean, compared to what other parents do. So what, what was that like? You said it wasn't a nine to five, but can you go into that it, a little it bit was, more? Yeah, it was a, a different and like, we had to be extra quiet because dad worked graveyard so he could see us uh, every day. And so during the, the days we had to be extra quiet because dad was sleeping. Uh, uh, mom was working, uh, various shifts, uh, different days off. Uh, this was back in the days when there was actually answering machines that would uh, pick up and you could hear the message. And so we screened all the calls to make sure it wasn't dad's work trying to call him in for mandatory overtime. Uh, mm -hmm. Like little things like that. And, you know, having a, a dad who's a cop and a mom who's a nurse and they've seen their own share of things. Like, I don't want to say it was exactly sheltered, but there was a lot of risks that other kids were allowed to take that I, I wasn't like mm -hmm. going out on my friend's boat on the 4th of July, not happening. Uh, my, cause my dad was like, I've pulled bodies out of that river. You're not going out there. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, and yeah, I, when I, when I tried to explain that to my friend, like why I can't go, he's like, I don't get it. Yeah. I can relate to that. That sounds familiar. Um, my daughter had asked if she could go on a boat trip with a friend and water ski and, that was a whole separate conversation. So it, it makes me think of how my kids were impacted now that I look mm -hmm. back on that. So, um, did your, did your family members, like your dad or your mom, did they ever talk about things like at cases or things that they worked on or do they keep that pretty separate? Um, no, they, they talked about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, when I was young, like, uh, my mom talked more about it, but just more like the saving people's lives, uh, kind of thing. Uh, my dad was more quiet, and so he didn't talk a lot about uh, mm -hmm. what he went through, especially like early on in his career. Um, 
And then like later as I got older and was more interested, uh, he still, I kind of left a lot of the, the traumatic things out. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I can remember uh, uh, he got into a fight, a fight at the, cause he was an airport cop uh, for the last like 17 years of his career and getting a call at home uh, saying that he had gotten into a fight with a professional football player and got his ass kicked and was in the hospital. Oh no. Yeah. It, it wasn't bad, but that's how uh, he, he phrased it. And uh, I'm like, huh, my, my friend's dads don't have those uh, same experiences and stories. Yeah, no doubt. So you said that once you became a teenager or maybe it was a little bit younger, you, you knew that it was something that you might want to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I put myself on that path. Uh, I re- originally started college on a, a army ROTC scholarship. Uh, that was my path. I was going to, uh, join the army and see where that took. I wanted to do a uh, military service and I wanted to see how that could springboard me into a career in law enforcement. Uh, and then that didn't work out. It turns out I have a poor genetics. Hmm. I have a flat feet and there was a, a, a concern that maybe when I was younger, I had exercise induced asthma, which I don't really believe that was the, the case anymore. Uh, but that kept me out. And it was a bummer because I was signed in, signed all the paperwork. And I'm mm-hmm. uh, two weeks from moving out and going to college for my first year. And they're like, uh, oh, by the way, all that money you thought was for college, it's uh, it's not there anymore. We're canceling your contract, your scholarship, everything. Oh, man. Uh, so it was, a, it was good in a way. Of I, I went to college. I tried to fight it. Uh, in the end, the Department of Defense was like, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, and I had to find another way to pay for college. And at that time, uh, growing up, uh, my neighbor was a sergeant for a, a police agency that was associated with the Oregon Police Corps. Mm-hmm. And uh, that program still might exist in other parts of the country. It doesn't exist in the Pacific Northwest anymore. Uh, and uh, he yelled at me over the fence and passed me a flyer and said, hey, we need some applicants. And I was like, well, I need some college money, and this is what I want to do. And he, he did me a solid and helped me get through, like, a month's worth of testing uh, in a two-week window when I was home from college. And then two months later, I was uh, signed up and going to get money to go to college and come back to the Pacific Northwest and be a police officer. So you actually, there was a program that actually paid for college if you were going to go back and become a cop? Yep. That's amazing. Uh, Okay. Yeah. uh, Last I heard, and this is, God, it's been forever, uh, they were still doing that program down south, but uh, Oregon was uh, not looked at as a, having the same mentality as a lot of other agencies across the country. And so that, that money kind of went away, got funneled into the war on terror and uh, just kind of that money went away. And so the program went away. Well, at least you got the benefit of it and you didn't have to pay for college. It sounds like so good for you. <laughs> so then obviously you graduate and you, are you with the same agency that you started with? You've been in law enforcement for what, like 18 years now? Yeah, I'm, I'm just coming up on 18 years. I, I've been with, the, I'm a sheriff's deputy uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I've been with the same agency all 18 years. And uh, I, I've had a, a bunch of uh, special assignments during the way, like uh, patrol is my main duty. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're a, a medium-sized agency. So all the extra stuff I've got to do in my career has been on top of being a patrol deputy. And I've, uh, I've been a, a field trainer, a survival skills and defensive tactics instructor. Uh, I was on our domestic violence resource team for a number of years. I did five years on SWAT. Um, and I've been working uh, closely with our, our narcotics team the last uh, couple of years and uh, chasing around drug dealers and uh, wanted violent felons. So you've done all the exciting like cop stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, <laughs> I've done most of them, yeah. Awesome. So, so tell me, you know, you, I guess we're going to start here and then this will, we'll work our way backwards, but you, uh, you recently started a nonprofit organization called blue line golf. Um, but what led you to want to do that? I guess we need to back up. And if you don't mind kind of telling the listeners a little bit about your journey, because I know you, you reached out to me and talked about some of the things that you experienced. And now that's led you to a place where you want to help other first responders, um, by with golf and mindfulness, which, which I, I just learned when you sent me that email. So could you maybe explain a little bit about why golf, why mindfulness, and that what led you to kind of make that realization that that's a helpful tool? (sighs) Well, I mean, I, I guess to, 
start that is I, I to figure that out, I had to, to break. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that uh, as we go on. Um, I uh, had my mind completely broke. Um, I had a lot of problems going on. And uh, my head shrinker said, you need to get out of town. You need a break. You need to unplug. I want you to go to the beach. I want you to sit by the ocean. I want you to breathe and get a massage. Okay. So I go to the beach. I pick a, a nice resort. And I show up on a Friday afternoon. And I check in. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to book a massage for some time this weekend. And they said, there will be no massages. Oh. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, we're, we're booked solid. Sorry. Like, you can get a facial if you want. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, I guess I'm here. So I wandered on over to the bar and got a whiskey and was like, well, maybe I'll just go for a walk. And I was walking around the hotel and they had a, a yoga seminar. And um, uh, this is uh, back in my uh, single days. So I had a whiskey and a chance to go and maybe hang out with a yoga instructor for the weekend. <laughs> And okay. so I went in and I sat down and uh, it, it wasn't about the stretching side of yoga. It was more about the the spiritual practice and the mindfulness and all the pillars of yoga that I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. And so I sat there and listened to it and I'm like, wow, this is this is great. And the instructor started talking about uh, green therapy and, and being outside and hearing nature sounds. Uh, and then she said, well, this is a great place to practice all that and out on the golf course, too. And so after these couple of whiskeys that I had, my little SWAT brain says, you mean chasing that little white ball around for a couple hours is good for my brain? All right, I'm in. Uh, so I, we ended the, the seminar and uh, I got up in the morning and made a tea time and I went out and I rented clubs. I hadn't played golf in, oh God, like five, eight years. And I'd only played like once or twice a year before that. So I'm not a golfer. Mm-hmm. And I rented clubs and I went to it. I lost three boxes of balls in 18 holes, but I had the best time. And after it, I, I played by myself too. And I was like, wow, I feel relaxed. I just took a chance to breathe, uh, feel the air and let everything else go for a few minutes. And I felt really good. And I was like, okay, I'm a golfer now. And so I came back into town and I got fitted for clubs uh, and said, okay, I'm going to be a golfer. So I just do have to point out that maybe what started it was the yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm just exactly. kidding. <laughs> it, it all starts with yoga. Yeah. Everything always comes back to yoga. I have to say it. It's good. It's the guns and yoga podcast. Um, no, but that's, that's interesting. So that was like, it's almost like that was meant to be though, for you to be at that place at that time with that seminar going on with that message. That's incredible. Yeah, and so uh, for the next year after that, I played golf maybe, I averaged about once a week. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I was having a really hard time, uh, I'd play golf every day for like three days all weekend long. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I played a lot of golf. And then um, when it was my time to come off SWAT, uh, the end of the uh, training banquet for that year was uh, held at a, a, a military compound out at the coast and I was going out there. I, I wasn't part of the team at that time. I just come off. So they're training all day, but there's a banquet that night. And I'm like, I'm going to treat myself to a round of golf. So I found this really nice course, uh, out at the, near the, the base and played. And I was like, wow, golf has really helped me over the last year. I've, I've really become a better person. I'm more mindful. I'm more relaxed. I wonder if I could help other people with golf. Mm -hmm. And then that just kind of led down the path of like doing the research. How do I start a business? How do I start a nonprofit? How do I connect with people uh, to get my message out? How do I support their businesses? And um, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey because actually I was, uh, I was due to get out of law enforcement uh, about three years ago. I went back to school and uh, got an MBA and I'm like, all right, wow. I'm out. Uh, and then the world turned upside down and then the, Stability of a government job was very appealing. And yeah. now at 18 years on, I'm like, if I hold on, then I can lock in that retirement because I'm in a retirement system where if I do anything less than 25 years, I can't touch it until I'm 60. Oh, wow. Okay. But if I do 25, I can start drawing at 53. And that's seven years of thousands of dollars a month just mm -hmm. getting paid to me as a got me sticking around for a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. So... 
let me ask you this because i i'm not a golfer okay i uh, i actually live on a golf course believe it or not but i live across the street from the golf course and i see a lot of golf balls in my front yard and i i work obviously with a lot of cops who are friends of mine good friends of mine that are regular golfers mm -hmm. and um what is it for you about golf i mean i can make some assumptions here that do you think has been the most helpful uh it, it's about just being present at that mm -hmm. moment, letting everything else go, uh, and more importantly, letting go of control and expectation mm -hmm. of, uh, I, I can't make that ball do anything. I can do some things to kind of hit that ball in that direction, but in the end, I have to be uh, smooth and slow and deliberate and then accept uh, the outcome no matter what. And yeah. uh, I, I guess for like cop listeners, uh, I use the, the shooting analogy a lot when I was the first on SWAT. I was an okay shooter, but I, I needed to improve if I wanted to stay on that team. And what I found is I was trying to hit the target. I was focused on the result. Like, if I don't hit that target, they're going to throw me off. And they pulled me aside one day and said, hey, you're doing okay, but okay is not good enough for this team. Mm -hmm. You need to show improvement. You need to improve. And they said, don't worry about the result. I want you to focus on the process. So stance, grip, side alignment, trigger press, follow through, focusing on all those things, accepting a wobble zone on your optic and just let them fly. And once I just let go of the expectation that I had to be perfect, uh, that I had to hit the target, I actually became a, a solid shooter and I was uh, doing very well. Mm-hmm. Wow. Amazing. Cause what it sounds like is that you're describing, um, what mindfulness is obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And so when I applied that same principle to golf and being mindful and being present and letting go of expectation, I'm like, Oh, th this feels good. I am not a good golfer. I have not really improved. Uh, but I've improved personally. Uh, I am able to recognize, uh, more of my feelings where I'm tripping myself up. Uh, I'm able to kind of head things off like, oh, I'm about to go down a bad path. I'm about to get angry. Oh, I'm going to just take a deep breath and focus on what I can control, my attitude, uh, my effort, uh, little things like that. Because, um, you know, I, I kind of early in my life, uh, that that wasn't always the case. There, there's kind of like growing up, there was like a little bit of a, a victim mentality kind of instilled in me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was growing up, I was like, it's always somebody else's uh, problem and kind of how do I come out of that? How do I focus on myself? Uh, something I had to learn uh, later in life. Yeah. Don't we all learn things later than we wish that we, or later than we did want to. So what's really cool about this, I've never even thought about golf before because I'm not a golfer, but what you say makes so much sense. And what I think is so good is there are so many police officers that, that like mm -hmm. to play golf. And so What's cool about what you're saying is that taking care of yourself and learning to relinquish control, which is something that's very difficult for cops to do, it's not a one size fits all thing, right? And so- no, Absolutely. And, and this you know, is people just- People are like, I I'm horrible at golf. I don't wanna play golf. I'm like, well, what if we played golf where we're on teams? Yeah. Oh, I might yeah. do that. I might do a scramble. Like mm -hmm. they love scrambles because then no one sees how bad they are. Uh, oh, is that how that works? I don't know. Oh, that's, that's why I play in scrambles because I, I need uh, three other people to try and carry me sometimes. Uh, and then when you see like, what else does golf bring? Well, it brings community. Mm -hmm. It brings jokes. I mean, we come in a world where if you're not uh, busting your buddy's balls, that means you probably don't like them. Yeah. Uh, so getting out there on the course, being out, walking around uh, and having that community there is has been great. And, you know, even... Um, being in the Pacific Northwest, where it's always not necessarily always police friendly, uh, out on the golf course, I haven't had any issues with people. I've been very open with people like, yeah, this is what I do. And I like golf. And I've had some really great conversations with people that were just like, man, that's uh, just sharing our experiences. And uh, the golf course is a place where you get to communicate differently. Uh, one of our, our members recently told me this, that he's always had a good relationship with his dad, but when they started playing golf together, mm -hmm. it's gotten better because there's something about having an activity or a purpose that you're always kind of going on around that lends itself to just more natural conversation. 
So because I play golf with my dad once a month now, and our conversations are, are deeper and more open than they've ever been more open than to be like, Hey, let's just go have a, a cup of coffee and a beer. Mm-hmm. And so he's, he's really enjoyed connecting with his dad. And I, I want people to connect with themselves, their friends, their family. And it's just, it's a great way to accomplish all those. Yeah. That's amazing. So how have you so far in your community? Cause obviously you've started this in your community. How, how do you get the word out? How do people um, kind of come together with blue line golf? How, how does this work? Uh, yeah, I am a very, very small, uh, organization at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. it's funded by my, my overtime hours at this point. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, try to make connections with people like I did with you on, on social media, uh, to invite people to support us. Uh, and I, I'm really rolling the dice on this a lot because I don't have a huge business background. Yeah, I did get an MBA. And so I have some idea on where to go. But I've never done a lot of this, and I'm starting from the the ground up. And I have some people that I work with that are, are instrumental in helping me, and I'm I'm committing to it. So it's going to take some time because I'm just a a really small organization in the Pacific Northwest with uh, dreams of going national and having blue line golf in every state. So right now, are there events that you host um, or or is there like a time that everybody meets and gets together? Uh, Right now, uh, we have our single league in the the Portland area, uh, and it is uh, members uh, or police officers and their uh, significant others can play. And it's one round a month, and we set it up where you can play anytime you want. There will be a, a, a course of the month, and that's it. Get out, play around, take whoever. Uh, cause trying to organize anything on a cop schedule is horrible. Mm-hmm. So we give them the That's whole month. True. Yeah. Uh, play around a golf, submit your score and, um, we'll, we'll take it from there. And so we've had, uh, two rounds at this point and we're getting ready for our third round. Uh, we're going to do a, a main championship series, April through August, uh, in the Portland area. And we're looking for sponsors, uh, donors, uh, to have, uh, to make this like, uh, an ongoing thing. And then we're going to start uh, challenging uh, other groups. Cause right now it's, it's mostly my friends from my agency mm-hmm. uh, cause cops are, aren't very trusting. So when I tell people in other agencies, like, Hey, this is what we're doing. They're like, Oh yeah, that sounds cool. Well then join. Oh, I don't know. And then it's going to take them probably two years and then they'll be like, okay, now I'll join up. Sure. Well, so are you, so do they get to play this round of golf with, to no, uh, no cost to them? Is that? Uh, no, uh, we, uh, I'm working to organize, uh, golf courses to sponsor us by like, uh, reduced rates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they, uh, have to pay for their own golf. Uh, and, uh, my goal is as we grow, I really want to host a uh, wellness weekends, mm. uh, and, uh, have funding for that where we can go to a golf course, uh, have yoga, have mindfulness, uh, uh, play golf and have an opportunity for law enforcement officers and their spouses to come to. And like, how do you work on Here are some tools that you can use, uh, to better yourself, uh, on duty and off duty. Um, so that's where I'd like to go in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'll take care of the yoga. You take care of the golf. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm in yoga on the golf course. No, that's, that's such a great idea. I don't think that we can do enough things like that. Um, because, all like you said earlier, just being outside, there's something about just getting out fresh air. I mean, obviously there's evidence and science that says that, that it's beneficial to our mental health to be outside. We're not meant to be inside all the time. And I know, you know, this, but, um, especially people who work at night, uh, really making a concerted effort to see the sun. Um, because, I remember it's been a minute, uh, more than a minute that I, that I had to work overnights, but I remember just never seeing the light and not knowing back then the impact that that was having. And I, I didn't, I wasn't the kind of person that, that, uh, did well on overnights. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. I, I did well on the early night shift, getting off at like three or four in the morning, but doing deep nights and, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'm supposed to go off duty at like eight o'clock in the morning, but the sun comes up at five thirty, and the day starts burning my skin. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I did not do so good there. And now, uh, every once in a while, I'll volunteer to stay late. I work mostly swing shift, and I'll stay late for a couple hours. But then every once in a while, like I ended up with a a twenty hour shift last week, 
due to some stuff that we got into. And I'm getting up at like nine o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh yeah, this is why I don't stay up all night anymore. <laughs> So, uh, so when you were telling us the story, it kind of initially kicked off blue line golf at the, when you, your you called it your head shrinker, your therapist mm -hmm. <laughs> told you to go on vacation. How, what, can you give us a little bit of a, a time frame? So how long ago was that? Uh, that was 2018. So I think in January of 2018 is when I, I went to that, uh, that, uh, resort of the coast. And so within a couple of weeks before that, and I had been seeing my head shrinker for a couple of years up into that point, and okay. uh, I'd uh, been kind of unpacking at that point, like 15 years worth of uh, mm -hmm. things that I, I didn't deal with or didn't have the ability to deal with. And it really took me, sad to say, like I had to break and hit mm -hmm. pretty close to a rock bottom uh, to kind of like make a bunch of changes in my life across the board. Okay. So that was about, you said 2018, a few years before that. So maybe like 2015. So like about seven years ago is when you first started to see your, you say head shrinker. I, I can't say it. Therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> uh, well, I, I tell her that she's my, my head shrinker and she's okay with it. Yeah, no, I know. It's just, I, it, it's, it doesn't come naturally to me to say that, but so, so was it about 2015? Is that right? Uh, yeah. End of 2015, start of 2016, uh, 2016, uh, that spring is when I, uh, uh, I, I, I call it my breaking point the, that March of 2016, uh, I, I broke, um, I had, uh, what was the, the tipping point then is I had, uh, got, I was on our domestic violence team and I went to a training, it's called a, it's a FETI, it's Forensic Experiential Trauma Interview. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about how do you deal with uh, and interview victims that have been through traumatic experiences because their brains don't process information the same way that a, a normal person would. Um, and so I sat in this class for like three or four days and I listened to all the horrible case studies of like what people that are in love relationships do to each other at times. And I just, I remember feeling sick at, at the end of each day. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this work because somebody needs to do this work. And on the last day, the, uh, the, the main doctor that's uh, heads up this group, uh, was talking about empathy and how you need to have empathy for the victims and kind of get down on their level to help draw out their experience. And then she said, uh, you got to be careful of vicarious trauma because you kind of take on what mm -hmm. they, they go through. And as soon as she said vicarious trauma and said that, I just like threw my pen up in the air and I'm like, oh, that's it. That's what's wrong with me right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember sitting in that uh, room, just trying to hold it together, about ready to cry uh, and barely getting out of there and going home and uh, I was married at that time and uh, just collapsing on the floor crying, saying, I can't be a cop anymore. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I know it wasn't easy to, to tell that story, but uh, I think it's so important though, because I don't think that what you just described is, um, is some is unique. I, I know that there's a lot of times when we learn about something for the first time and it just kind of hits us over the head. And it just, you know, comes out of left field and it just triggers us. So oh, yeah, that... I, that's, yeah, that, that was the, the main trigger that I'm like, oh, I've got some serious problems. And then, so I started seeing, uh, uh, my therapist, you can uh, say I'll... head shrinker. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard yeah. time. <laughs> uh, I saw, I started seeing my head shrinker and I'm like, I, I know I've got some serious work that I've got to do. Um, and I need to go deep into it. And it involved like me unpacking all kinds of trauma from, from being a cop and before trying to figure out how I got to this point and where I need to improve in my life. And then, uh, how it affected, uh, uh, my marriage at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was like a really hard time because I'm thinking I can't be a cop anymore and I'm struggling. And, uh, uh my wife at that time, uh, two weeks later, it says, yeah, I've been looking for apartments. I'm moving out and I'm taking the kids. Mm -hmm. And 
I have no idea. Uh, and like we had talked about me seeing a counselor like not once or twice over the years, like when big things happened. And I see a counselor sporadically. Uh, but what I re remember is like when I was breaking, uh, she was telling me like, you're, uh, you probably have PTSD. You're checked out. You're not here. Uh, I've been begging you to do this. And it, it's funny because when she said, I've been begging you to do this like all the time, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to uh, what she had said that, yeah, I was probably checked out a lot. I was struggling with a lot of things uh, that was going on at the time. And so I'm in danger of losing my marriage at that time on top of my world is turned upside down. I don't know if I can continue in my career and I have to start fresh on a lot of things. And, uh, so I'm, I'm doing all this personal work on myself, uh, and working on my marriage. And, uh, what I found out about my marriage is that, uh, I guess she, I'll just leave it as she hadn't wanted to be married for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And when all the cards were on the table, I like immediately was like, I'm out, I'm divorcing you. I don't care what this costs. Uh, I'm not going to be here. I will take care of my kids. I'll be the best stepdad I can be, or not stepdad. <laughs> I'll be the best uh, single dad I can be, but I am out like mm -hmm. in an instant. And um, so I had to like reinvent myself and start my whole life over again in the midst of uh, figuring out uh, my brainium issues. And so when you realize, and you call it your breaking point, um, when you realize that it was time to get help and, and see a therapist or a head shrinker, how did you find the person that you ended up seeing? Did you get a recommendation? Cause that's probably one of the harder things to do is as a cop, especially is to find the right fit for, for therapy. Uh, yeah. Um, I had uh, gone through, uh, my agency's EAP program. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, they just give you a list and here are some people and the EAP program is great to help get you in the door, but it's not necessarily set up for like long-term care. Yeah. Um, so I, I, talked to a couple people and they just, they really didn't fit. And, uh, so then, uh, uh, at that time, my wife and I were looking for a marriage counselor and mm -hmm. we found someone, uh, who she has a sleep disorder. And so she keeps odd hours and works until like 11 o'clock at night, most nights. And I'm the like, therapist. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. And so that was great. So I'm like, okay, I, I can work with that schedule. Cause like, I get off work at eight or nine o'clock on uh -huh. my swing shift at that time. Sure. And this is someone that we could go and see. And uh, her, her father was a, a police officer like way back in the day. And so she has a, a soft spot for cops and we just kind of hit it off. And uh, uh, the marriage counseling did not work out at all. Uh, <laughs> but I took a liking to her and I was like, Hey, uh, yeah, we're not gonna be doing marriage counseling anymore, but I, I do need a, a head shrinker and she was like yeah i'm still in and so i've been seeing her every other week or more for five years wow that's great and what's important i want to make sure people listen to what you said a couple of things when i talk about finding therapists for cops um we talk about a term called being culturally competent meaning being familiar mm -hmm. with our the, the work that we do and so that's so important and the second thing is, is that you said you did talk to a few that didn't work out, but you kept looking. So a lot of times that's not what happens. Somebody might try one person one time and they're like, yeah, this isn't going to work. And then they give up. So I applaud you for not giving up because it can be really easy to do that because it's just, you know, Hey, I tried and, and this isn't helping. So mm -hmm. that's a, th that's something I wanted to make sure people who are listening, who might be considering seeing a therapist, uh, because I always use the analogy of dating. Like you don't just like marry the first person you go on a date with, right? You have to date around and, and try to find the right person. That's a good fit for you. Yeah, absolutely. And that was key. Cause I, I'd been through a couple other uh, head shrinkers that were very competent and uh, some on paper were probably more culturally competent than the, the gal I see now. Uh, but she just, she fits. Yeah. And that, that was, uh, that was the, the biggest part is find somebody that you like, find somebody that you connect with, uh, find someone that like makes you laugh. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's really the, the big thing why I 
enjoy about any conversation with anyone is if you can make me laugh, uh, you get my buy-in. So I don't want to yeah. see uh, a therapist that's like very like ho hum and drawn out and very flat. Like I want like laughter and laugh at the absurdity of certain things. Or if I like get on a tirade and I like say the just ridiculously off the wall things, giggle about it because I don't have any ill intent. I'm just like venting mm -hmm. uh, and. Yeah, don't think I'm weird because of all the things that I've been through. Well, we are definitely a unique group. And so, I mean, not every therapist is cut out to see cops. <laughs> yes, that, that's that's true. Yeah. So, um, so you mentioned, you know, unpacking some things and talking about things that even happened before you became a police officer. And that's another thing I want to make sure people kind of hone in on because I know that people don't like to talk about childhood trauma and things that happen to us before we get on the job, but, um, but it's something that's very relevant to, to this conversation, not just your, my conversation with you, but just in general. And I, I'll be the first person to admit, I would have never thought that. And, um, several years ago, I, I started learning about childhood trauma and the ACEs and, uh, I read a couple of books and it's really been beneficial to me personally to see, okay, these things that happened to me when I was younger, it makes sense. It all fits. Mm -hmm. And so if you're willing to kind of maybe speak to that a little bit and how learning and putting things together has helped in your, your healing. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're young and you're a child and even in your teenage years, you just, your frame of reference is so small. You don't mm -hmm. understand life and how things uh, fit and interact. And you're just kind of, you just, you don't get it yet. And um, my looking back, my first brush with trauma, I was uh, about 11 or maybe 12 years old. Uh, and it was around the time that uh, both my grandparents died on my dad's side. Uh, they died within a few months of each other. Um, and there's a lot of family dynamics that go into mm -hmm. that. Uh, I had a lot of uh, relatives that, uh, uh, were alcoholics, uh, mm -hmm. probably had undiagnosed mental health issues. Uh, and it, it became, uh, kind of a, a big deal in our family of like grandpa died. And then, uh, having another family member, uh, taking advantage of grandma, draining her bank account. And then my mm -hmm. dad having to step in and take control. And, uh, that really didn't set well with some of the family members. And it became an issue, uh, one night, uh, we were all sitting around watching TV or something, and the phone rang, and my mom answered it, and she just looks weird. I'm like, that's weird, and like she loves to talk on the phone. That's that's one of her things. And then she just goes, "It's for you," and hands it to my dad. And I'm like, my dad doesn't talk on the phone. Oh. He he was a, a very quiet person. He didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't talk on the phone. And I remember sitting there, just kind of listening out of the side of my head, and like, he's like, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, you have a good night. And then he hung up. And then he, did, he had like zero emotion. And I'm like, that's really weird. And my mom's like, what was that? And he goes, oh, that was, uh, that was uh, Uncle Gary. And uh, he says, if uh, grandma's not back in her home, uh, we'll all be dead by morning. Oh, my gosh. So he was on the phone with your uncle? Yes. And he said that directly to your dad? Yes. Okay. And so then uh, it was like, then it became more real. And uh, what I found out is that kind of had been building for a couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. then finding out that, no, uh, my aunt had been calling the FBI in, in the middle of the night. And the FBI is calling my dad being like, did you kidnap your mom? No. Okay. Well, your sister called in again <laughs> uh, kind of thing. And so then it became... It, it was it was out in the open. Uh, my parents had kind of sheltered us from that a little bit because I mean I was mm. I'm the oldest of uh, three and I'm 11 or 12 years old. That's not really my spot to be in. But uh, then it became real, and uh, I don't remember all the details. But uh, talking with my mom, other family members said like, "No, uh, we're legitimately scared for your kids. Like we might not agree with all the decisions, but we're scared for your kids." Oh and wow! So then all of a sudden it became. Uh, Family meetings were not about like soccer practice. Family meetings were about uh, what happens if your uncle shows up. Uh, so I'm uh, 11 or 12 years old and my Friday night is spent with my dad uh, talking about how do you do a, a contact shot to someone's face? Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't know. Uh, I look back now and I'm like, wow, that's pretty fucked up to put on an 11 year old. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that was uh, the early nineties and no one really knew. And uh, so that was a, a big defining moment in my life of like, I, I remember having like horrible dreams. Uh, the dreams were like, I'm breaking out my window, trying to run away, not being able to get anywhere, getting shot in the back, uh, snapping out like actual, like traumatic PTSD dreams at 11 years old. I remember like counselors and teachers coming up to me all like, Hey, are you okay? You know, you can talk and me being like, I'm fine. I wasn't fine. I just didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize how numb I was to everything. And so I, uh, put on a lot of weight. I was kind of withdrawn and, uh, kind of went through some hard times for a while. And then, but I didn't really deal with them either. They just kind of went away because like life went on. Right. So what do you think it was? Obviously you weren't able to hide it very well. If you had teachers and counselors coming up, do, do you, can you look back now and see what it was that, that they knew that there was something wrong, why they approached you? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, my parents had told all the schools kind of okay. what was going on. And so they, they knew that there had been a uh, recent deaths in the family and there was legitimate concern that, uh, uh, maybe there, we were in danger kind of thing. So they were aware that stuff was going on and then they see like actual changes in, in my behavior. Uh, the, 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 like, we need to keep checking in on him. Yeah. And so as time goes on and you said, things just kind of move on. You don't really, things don't really change. They just, time just moves on and you don't really get help or address it. And then you start at some point to, to start riding along with your father or had that already been happening? Uh, no, that, that happened a couple years later. Cause, uh, uh, I wasn't quite old enough at that time to do ride alongs. And mm-hmm. so then when I got into, uh, uh, middle school and high school, then I got to do ride alongs. And, uh, in high school, my senior project, uh, was actually with my dad as my, uh, one of my mentors, cause he had been on the bomb squad at that time. And so I got to hang out with the bomb squad and go around and blow things up for a senior project. Fun. That sounds yeah. like it'd probably be fun for a kid. Oh yeah. It was a, 18, a great yeah. time. I, I loved it cause I wanted to be in law enforcement. And, uh, I mean, training days for a special team is those are like great times. Cause we're going to go out, we're going to blow things up. We're going to have a great bunch. We're going to go blow more stuff up. And hopefully sometime during the day, there's a call out. Uh, so, so as you're in your childhood, you have this, this experience and then things just kind of move forward. It doesn't really get addressed, but you move on. And then at what point, cause you said you knew you wanted to be a cop or you were doomed to be in law enforcement <laughs> as you put it. What do you, was there a defining moment, do you think, or was it just a series of things or is it just something that was expected? What, what do you think it was that made you know that it was for you? I, I don't know. I think it had uh, to do with like helping people, bringing order to chaos. Uh, it wasn't my dad because he said you should have been a firefighter. Uh, that's funny because I would not expect him to say that. Usually oh, cops yeah. don't say that. <laughs> oh, actually, like, well, I don't know. Like, co- cops out here have been saying that for a while. Like, why don't you uh, be a firefighter? Be everyone's hero. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, eh. I, I, and I, I love my hose dragger friends, uh, but it just it didn't really set with me. And I, I really can't say definitely why, because like, they I wasn't pushed into law enforcement, mm-hmm. but it just kind of resonated with me, and I just put myself on that path. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if it was like this for you, but for me, um, I had some things that that I grew up with as well. That some pretty traumatic experiences and violence and alcohol and things like that in my home. And I knew, like I knew, when I was about the same age that you just said. So it's really interesting. Eleven, twelve. Um, I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew why I wanted to do it because at that time. I was smart enough to know that what was going on wasn't right. And I knew that I wanted to do something about it, but I couldn't, and I felt very helpless. So it was very clear for me. It's, it's kind of strange. I know it's not like that for everybody. So I can pinpoint exactly when and why I felt the way I did. And, and obviously I, you know, I lived my childhood dream. Uh, I wish I would have known some things about, Mm -hmm. about things before I started into my career, but you know, better late than never. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like when I, uh, first uh, joined the, the police corps program in like 2003, 2004, we were just starting to have like talks about like, 
trauma and taking mm -hmm. care of yourself. And it was, yeah. it was becoming a thing. Um, but also it was still kind of like, there's still a stigma of like, you got to tough a lot of stuff out. Uh, and you know, like the, the first time I really realized like, oh, maybe I have some issues to deal with was actually in the, the police academy. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my uh, classmates, uh, uh, his uh, had a family member that was uh, killed in a, a, a training accident. Uh, and he put on a, a, pr a presentation about it. And it really went home, hit home with me because there was part of the video that he showed from the funeral of uh, a, a military funeral. And I had my first flashback. Of I was sitting in that room watching this video, and then all of a sudden I was 11 years old again, holding uh, my grandfather's flag, and mm -hmm. kind of relived all that like in an instant. And I'm like, "Oh shit, I got a problem." Uh, and you know, I I told the the, the sergeant because uh, he he had actually been my neighbor growing up, and I'm like, "Hey, Sarge, I got a problem." And do you remember all the stuff that happened like 10 years ago or more? And he's like, "Oh yeah, I, I kind of remember like." Yeah, this this happened last night, uh, and he's like, "Well, we got to take care of you," and so we. That was kind of like, let's start taking care of you, but it was like on me, and I'm 24 years old. What do I know about taking care of myself? I'd been a a Division One college rugby player and uh, not really taking care of myself for the last few years. I've been uh, playing rugby and partying more than I had been uh, studying. <laughs> yeah. So what is, so that's interesting because, you know, we've come so far in general in law enforcement and this in no way is to call somebody out for not doing something. Cause I mean, I don't know that we knew what to do back then. So when he said, we need to take care of you, that was him just telling you, you need to take care of you. Right. Not we as, or, or was there something that he was able uh, to help you I think you it was, with? it was both. It was like, there's my responsibility to myself. And mm -hmm. then there's also like our responsibility of community to, uh, understand each other what's going on and, and give each other uh some grace yeah uh, and allow people to struggle so um was there any like resources that he was filling you in on hey like you can go talk to this person or here's something you can do was there any of that uh he gave me, well, actually, we got several books, and I think I got one of the books early uh, when I talked to him. Uh, I believe it was uh, uh, one of Dr. Alexis Artwell's books. I think it was Deadly Force Encounters. And so it was kind of like, start with this, and then we got uh, uh, Dr. Gilmartin's book, uh, Emotional Survival. Uh, we, I, I got those, and those are resources to kind of help normalize my experience that, mm -hmm. you know, you're not alone in this. This happens to a lot of people. Uh, and so understanding that it's normal, uh, was a, a big help, but understanding that it's normal is not the same as like being proactive about it. Cause when I looked at that back then, I'm like, oh, this is normal. If I just work harder, this will take care of itself. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you had those resources back then and it made you feel like at least, uh, you weren't the only one that was experiencing this or going through that, but but obviously, um, at some point, um, it's going to resurface. And it sounds like from some of the things that you, you told me about before we rec started recording, um, when you sent me your email that, you know, the, the trauma continued throughout your career. Yeah, it, it did. I mean, like for the next like few years, uh, early on in my career, it was, it was hard, uh, with a family, like working, uh, nights, having little kids at home. Uh, my wife had, uh, lost her job, uh, we had to declare a bankruptcy because she had been out of work mm -hmm. for so long. We couldn't make it on, have a home on a single family income. So there was a lot of things that uh, happened that were really, really stressful. But I was still in the, if I work harder, if I work more overtime, if I shut my mouth and just kind of get after it, things will get better. And uh, they, they really didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so I, I'm not, still not dealing with a lot of my issues at this point. And then 2012 was a absolutely horrible year for me. Um, uh, January 2nd, uh, 2012, uh, I got a call from my mom in the morning. She was frantic. Uh, uh, my dad had, uh, they had been divorced for about three months at that time. My dad, uh, pulled into her driveway sometime that morning and, uh, shot himself in the head. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, he had uh, done 27 years in law enforcement. He was retired. He had been uh, retired less than 
less than three years, maybe even less than two. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of look back at my dad's history. I mean, he had a lot of trauma, a lot of things that weren't healthy that he never dealt with. And it all culminated when I got that call that morning. So sorry. Yeah, that's, that's not something anyone should ever have to deal with a phone call that you ever have to get. Yeah, it, it was, it's, it's a rough phone call. And for me, it was a, a rough phone call because I mean, that's not just my dad, but like, uh, our relationship had gotten better over the years. Like not that we ever had a bad relationship, but we had been able to connect more once I became a cop because I understood more things. So we'd be on vacation in Hawaii and set up a, after everyone else went to bed, we'd sip gin and tonics and talk shop and, and connect and tell stories in the old days kind of thing. And then all of a sudden he just wasn't there anymore. So was there ever any indication like looking back that, that he was struggling? Was he seeking help or seeing a therapist or anything? Yeah. Uh, I mean, him and my mom had been having uh, a lot of problems for the last, like, definitely a year. Uh, and I don't really know all the details because uh, my dad was very quiet. So I, I've only gotten one side of the story. And so there, there's more to it that I just I don't know. But I know that uh, when my mom and dad got divorced, uh, my dad struggled. He kind of, like, lived in his trailer he was withdrawn, um, didn't really have a lot of money, and he wasn't taking care of himself. And then at some point, he ended up uh, in a hospital uh, for a couple of days, uh, probably on a psych hold. Uh, and uh, I can't remember if it was my mom or my grandma told me uh, that he was there, and he'll probably call at some point. And he called me a couple of days later, and uh, you know, I just said, I, I love you, and uh let me know what I can do to help. I'm here. And he says, okay, thank you. And that was about it. He did. He didn't want me to come up to see him or anything like that. Uh, and he got out and kind of carried on for the next couple months. And, uh, we just, we didn't really know. And, uh, after going through his thing after his death, uh, I found, uh, a calendar. He had been marking off days for over a year, uh, that he had a date in mind and we didn't know. Hmm. Wow. So after the death of your father, um, what was it like? How were you able to kind of get through that? Cause you said, cause it, it seems like if I'm following your timeline correctly, I'm not, I'm not a math major, but you, you said a few years later is when maybe you hit your point, your breaking point. So there's still a little bit of time yet before you, things start to, to get to the point where you finally get to see your therapist. And, and Oh start... yeah. Uh, so getting through my dad's suicide was, uh, a, a really hard thing. Uh, you know, I, I credit to some of my supervisors that worked with me uh, at that time uh, doing whatever they could. So they just said, whatever you need, you let us know. And in the midst of all that trauma and what's going on, you don't always know. But I can remember like, uh, like there was just a couple of days where I'm like, I'm in tears. And I'm like, I call my sergeant. Like, I didn't, I just couldn't even talk. I was like starting to cry already. He goes, all right, sick day. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And so they, they took care of me and allowed me a chance to grieve and, and take care of that and just have a bad day and just kind of like not come to work. That's really good that you had a supportive, you know, you had people that were looking out for you. And I'm curious, um, was there anything in place at the time, like at your agency for other resources other than being supportive? And that's very important peer support and being able to rely on your peers, but um, I mean, I know you said something about an EAP, but was there anything else in place that you were able, that was, that was helpful or that you were aware of? Uh, or I, I don't think there's anything that I was aware of. Uh, also I, I really wasn't, uh, in tune with what I really needed and how deep mm -hmm. I really needed to go at that point. Um, I was still just working harder. Mm -hmm. If I just work harder, it'll resolve itself. If I just, if I toughen up, it, it'll get better. It can't get any worse than this, right? Uh, no, it, it did. Uh, yeah, that year was, was rough. Uh, uh, shortly after my dad died, maybe a couple of months, uh, I got an email from a, a woman uh, saying that her husband had died. And it was uh, impactful to me because uh, I'd actually made friends with him 
because I had saved his life on duty uh, about three or four years before that. Uh, it was oh, a wow. 911 call for, it was just a 911 hang up call. And I happened to be right around the corner. And as I'm pulling up in front of their house, like, oh no, it's, it's a code medicals en route. And I ran upstairs and uh, drug this guy off the bed and started CPR. And uh, I got credited. Uh, well, there's several of us there that night that all helped out. Uh, but they said all of our efforts uh, kept him from having uh, brain damage and we, we brought him back. Oh, and so wow. after that, like uh, he made sure to anytime he saw any of my coworkers to, to say thank you to them and tell, tell the story. Uh, I'd actually, cause that happened right at Thanksgiving. Uh, every Thanksgiving I'd stop by his house on duty and, uh, hug his kids and stuff like that and hang out. So we actually became pretty close. And we always joke that uh, we're the only men that we've ever kissed. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so that was uh, really challenging to deal with. And then uh, just kind of plugging away and summer went on and things went good. And uh, then in September, uh, I mean, I'd been involved in uh, uh, several uh uh, serious things, uh, throughout, uh, my career. Um, well, uh, and, and don't feel like you have to go through every single thing. I mean, I'm not, this, this is really up to you and how much you want to share just so you know. Okay. Yeah. That's, that sounds good. Uh, no, I, I think it, it feels good to get it all out. Good. Um, yeah, this, uh, yeah, the next spot in 2012 was, uh, I was involved in a shooting. Oh, man. Uh, I had actually gone to do a, a welfare check on someone and uh, they were having some severe mental health crises and I was talking to them at a, a door. The door was just kind of cracked and we're trying to offer our help. And uh, he threw the door open and threw bleach all over me and then started stabbing me. Oh, man. Uh, so that was a a horrible position to be in. And, uh, I reacted, uh, very violently and won that fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he lived, which is good. Cause I, he wasn't like a, any one that he actually never had any law enforcement contact prior to that. He his worst day, uh, got him shot. Yeah. And, uh, so that was uh, a really hard thing to go through. Like, okay, my dad uh, committed suicide earlier this year. My friend had uh, just passed away. And now I'm involved in uh, my first OIS. And it was an up close and personal one where I was actually injured in the process. And from what I understand, hearing other people's stories, the closer you are to the actor, uh, the more intense some of the reactions can be. And kind of going through that process of like, unpacking what happened and why do I not have memory? Why do I have snapshot memory? Uh, mm -hmm. Why did, uh, why was like the first thing I thought right after that? Like, cause I never really felt uh, comfortable in the new holsters uh, they'd given us that we just got bucket holsters for lights. And I never felt as fast as I felt as the old Safari land holsters. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember like it happened. And I'm like, fuck, I am fast. Oh, we should got, got to go back to work. And then, uh, like, why did my brain think that? Um, yeah. So I, that was uh, interesting. And then, so I'm on admin leave, uh, for that next, uh, two or three weeks leading up into the, the hunting trip where like me and my uncle and my, my best friend go and spread my dad's ashes. And so it just, that was like every three or four months, just getting my guts stomped in, mm -hmm. uh, and getting through that. It was a, a very challenging year. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, so at, at the point where you're in the shooting and you're off for a couple of weeks, do you, do, is there anything in place where they have you talk to somebody before you come back to work or is that, yeah, is that a, yeah, we have a whole protocol for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it involves like a time off. It involves, uh, uh, a trip to see the, 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 uh, a therapist, the head shrinker. Uh, the head shrinker, yes. <laughs> uh, it involves uh, a, like a return to duty, not an assessment, but like a, a refamiliarization of like, let's get out on the range. Let's let's shoot guns for part of a day. Let's go and get on the mats and, and, and wrestle and, and do some uh, scenario training uh, just to kind of get used to being back in that environment, uh, mm -hmm. which is, is very helpful just to kind of like prime you to go back because the 
first night that I go back, uh, I end up uh, in a parking lot alone with a suicidal guy armed with a knife and taking him like into custody almost by myself. Wow. And I'm like, God, why couldn't this have been like, night two? Why night one? And that was interesting because uh, I – my, 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 my beat wife told me he, he shows up and he's like, do you remember being behind your patrol car after everything was like kind of calmed down? I'm like, no, he goes, you totally took a knee and had your rifle sitting next to you. And I came up and unloaded your rifle for you mm. and put it away. And I'm like, I don't remember any of that. And then I was like, I wish you would have told me that because when I went and got my rifle and was like, okay, I need to unload it myself. There wasn't a round in the chamber. So for the next like three years, I thought I was running around with an unloaded rifle that night. So you didn't know that until three years later? Yeah, because he, he finally told me that story when we were talking about that. And I was like, oh, you son of a bitch. I would have like that messed me up that I really thought I had a an empty chamber that night. And I could have. Mm, wow, uh, I, I can you imagine. Know, that's the power of like after I got through that incident, I'm like, oh, and I don't remember. I just kind of checked out for a moment. And so you continue on every couple of months, you've got these things that keep popping up, but you still keep plowing through and not until a significant amount of time later, do you finally start yeah. to understand that you need to get some help? Yeah. The, the, the last, uh, uh, well, the, before my last one, uh, was, uh, I was the first on scene to a stabbing, uh, and a young woman died right in front of me. Uh, she had been stabbed in the heart. And, uh, that was a very helpless feeling. Uh, I, I actually, cause that was the same month that I got on SWAT. So I'm a, I don't even think I had had my first training day yet. So I'm not even officially on SWAT for like two more weeks. Uh, and I get called to this. I'm the first one there, uh, trying to render aid. And my training was, uh, limited at that time and not realizing there was nothing that anyone could do. Um, uh, and I kind of realized like how much I believe in a soul at that point, because mm -hmm. like I'd seen dozens, if not a hundred or more dead bodies by that time, but watching the life leave someone right mm -hmm. in front of you is, is very different. And I was like, Oh, that sucks. I don't like this. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was like, okay, I got to deal with this. Well, two weeks later is my very first uh, day on SWAT. And it was a, a team training day for a, a mass casualty incident. Like, I'm not trusted to do anything at this time other than uh, you need to drive the truck with all the gear to the training site. Uh, and one of the, it, we were training uh, other uh, officers for other departments in mass casualty incident uh, training. And they told me, go grab your gear. You're going to be part of the next training iteration and we're going to evaluate you and whether or not we keep you around or not was mm -hmm. kind of the joke. Um, so I go grab my, my training gear and I, I jump in the next iteration and it's the, the scenario is a, a, an active threat with, where also a bomb has gone off. And so we have all these role players that volunteer and they're all done up in moulage kits. And I remember running into a building with the first wave of people that are like, okay, we've got an active threat and stepping over a role player who was very, very good at her job and doing what looked like uh, agonal respirations. And I remember looking down and whoa, hmm. complete flashback. Uh, the, the young woman who died was inserted right over that. And mm -hmm. I watched it all happen again. And I remember shaking my head and going, I can't do this now. They're watching. And mm -hmm. I get to get on with the training. And I got through that. And at the end of the day, I was like, uh, yeah, I, I got things to, to unpack. But I didn't unpack them then either. And then mm -hmm. flash forward. Uh, about a year and a half later was that, uh, that day for the domestic violence training. And I just finally snapped. Mm -hmm. Well, and unfortunately, sometimes that's the way it has to be. We have to hit rock bottom for us to know that, that we need help. And the important thing is, and again, I really appreciate you sharing that. I know it's not easy. Um, but I think the important thing is, is that you did get help and you're still continuing to get help and you're focused on continuing to get better and better every day. And, um, what, I guess what I want to ask you is this, as we kind of wrap up here for somebody listening who, what you say really probably, you know, resonates with them. 
What would you say to somebody who has been through an incident and it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the amount of incidents that you were in because, you know, you've definitely been through a lot in a short amount of time and then over your, over your lifetime, what would you say to somebody who is struggling and who has flashbacks and who is, you know, there is, there are issues in their marriage. What, you know, what would your advice be? Uh, it's, it's probably like, find your thing, find what resonates with you. Uh, for me, it ended up, uh, being golf. Uh, but I know people that do, uh, martial arts, they do yoga. Uh, they, uh, have big expensive boats and they spend all summer out, uh, on mm -hmm. the water, like more than just recognizing that what you're going through is normal, find something that you're passionate about and do it. Uh, and enjoy it and en enjoy life and enjoy your community and your family. Um, <laughs> What'd you say? My wife said hang from the ceiling in your underwear. <laughs> oh, I love that. We're going to keep, can we keep that in please? Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm serious. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, my, my, my wife is amazing. Uh, she's a, a medical examiner for the area that I work in. Uh, our love Very story cool. is we met over top of a dead body. Oh, that is so romantic. And hey, thank yes, you to I you. Agree. No, thank tell her thank you because the the last responders, the people that do her job, they don't get thanked enough. She says last responders don't get thanked enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's taking care of yourself and finding what your your passion is and like you said for me it's golf and I want everyone to come and play golf even if they don't like golf. Just come out and play for the day. If you play once a year, rent clubs. But if you don't want to play golf, just do something and recognize that it, it takes work. And working harder is not an answer. Working harder at a specific task is an answer. Uh, it's, you got to have a, a process, not just an end. Like, oh, if I work harder, things will work out. No, if I work harder at seeing a therapist, at uh, drinking less or uh, working out more, those are the things that will lead to success. Well, and by work, when you describe it as working harder, to me, what you're saying is you're pushing through and you're ignoring what's going on. I mean, you're stuffing it down, you're putting it off to the side and you're ignoring it. So oh, it's, absolutely. It's, yeah. so we're great at that. Yeah. But for a short period of time, it serves us very well to mm -hmm. detach and not have that emotion and get through a very chaotic and traumatic circumstance but we're the worst at dealing with it afterwards yes. uh, at times. Some people are better at it than I am. Well, and you're, you're absolutely right. We have to do that for a short amount of time and get through it. But what, what's so important about what you just said is you have to make time to unpack it. And, and it's not easy. It sucks, right, to have to deal with all that stuff. And so it's understandable why, why people don't. It's easier not to. And sometimes that short-term... Uh, not so healthy fix is, you know, is the easiest thing to do. Yeah. And uh, one, of, one of the things my head shrinker told me is that the more vulnerable you are, the less vulnerable you are. And mm -hmm. so like going through this story for the first time public, he's been very, very challenging for me in a lot of ways. Uh, but it, it needs to be done. And like, I, mean, I just sat here and cried on your podcast and, uh, I want people to know that that's normal and that's part of it and part of the process and it's, it's okay. Exactly. And so the thing about, you know, why I'm so, I'm such a proponent of peer support and such a proponent of people talking about these things is the exact reason that your head shrinker just told you to is because when you talk and you get it out, you feel better. I mean, I can, I can actually see a difference physically. I know the, the listeners can't see your face, mm -hmm. but you look different. You look lighter. You look a little bit more relaxed and light. Oh, that's good. Cause my, my shoulders have been glued to my ear for like a, a week now. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed that. And I was actually kind of wanted to walk you through some yoga stuff, but I didn't want to interrupt your story. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, I, I really appreciate that. And, and let's kind of just finish on what, what we started with, which was blue line golf. And so yes. that's, that's what helped you. And it sounds like therapy has been a huge part of, of your healing too. And let's not, let's not discount the, 
the aerialist and the uh, medical examiner wife you've got. She seems pretty, pretty kick ass. <laughs> oh yeah. She is. She's a, uh, she's amazing. And she's been a, a big support in all this. And uh, yeah, I'll send you some, uh, some of her uh, videos and uh, she's a very interesting and unique person. Well, and it just goes to show you that everybody has their thing, right? You know, she's, oh, yeah. she's got a difficult job too, but she has this amazing, cool hobby that obviously I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, that really benefits her mental health too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it would, uh, golf, like, uh, what I'm working towards is having, uh, more and more people join up our leagues and, and playing golf. And as we grow, then the more events I can do, the more people that I can sponsor for uh, golf tournaments, uh, uh, sending cops to play golf. And like, I really want to focus on the, the mindfulness and the healthy aspects mm -hmm. of playing golf. I, I really don't want this to become, Oh, let's, let's send a bunch of cops to get drunk and play golf. Like that. That's not what we're about. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's about community and connecting with yourself and connecting with your friends and family and, and having a good time and relaxing and enjoying your community and so I want to do more leagues. Uh, I want to host tournaments. Uh, I want to host a uh, wellness weekends. Uh, of course, like in my, my cop brain, like I want to do that all now because <laughs> I got a problem. Solve it now. Like that's yeah. what I've been learning about business. It's, it's going to take time. And uh, I'm looking for people that want to join up, join forces, start a league, have a tournament, uh, partner on a tournament uh, or just, a donate to our cause or sponsor some cops to go and play golf and get a chance to unwind. Well, first of all, I'm really glad you addressed the no alcohol, like not wanting to get a bunch of cops together and get drunk because that's what we usually do when we get together. And so I'm really glad you, you said that because I'm, I'm not, I'm not against drinking, but I think it's really good that that's not the focus of, yeah. of what you're talking about. So if someone's listening, right. And they're in a different part of the country. And cause I know, like I said, even just here in Kansas, there's so many people I know that play golf that are cops. What do you, should they just reach out to? Do you have a website email? How do people get a hold of you? Uh, yeah, my website is a uh, blue line golf Uh, I can be found on uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, at blue line golf USA. Uh, if you if you're interested in what we're doing, follow us, like us, uh, send me a DM. If you want to get involved, uh, I, I'm happy to talk to anyone and see what we can do about starting leagues or hosting tournaments. Uh, our paperwork for being a nonprofit has been submitted. It's being processed right now, uh, so people can donate to our cause if they'd like. Uh, I'm just open for business and uh, seeing where this adventure goes. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you again so much for sharing your story and spending time with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Matt. I encourage you to please share and give us a review if you like what you heard. I want to hear more from you, so please reach out with any questions or feedback. And check out the show notes for the ways to get a hold of or find out more information about Blue Line Golf. And remember, we are better together.